Not tonight at a reasonable hour. I know you've worked hard, and uh, there's a lot of teaching that we're trying to do. You're so gracious, so thankful that you're here. Your 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 presence encourages us, and you're making a statement to the to the kingdom. And we're so grateful for your love for souls. And I know that uh, I know that you can do this. This is a talented church, a church with so many resources. And I know that this congregation, any congregation. And I, I, I want to see Thessalonica in Memphis. From, from you sound about the word of the Lord. You are examples to all those in Macedonia and Achaia. I mean, we need Thessalonica in Memphis, Tennessee. I mean, we need a Thessalonica in every state of America. And if we could get some Thessalonica, some churches that shine, they were, they, they were the shining city on the hill. They were the, they were the, the light that, 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 of, of Christ. And other churches will notice I just can't think but to, to, to be mindful of the, of the attention that the Forest Hill Church gets. And if the news spreads, listen, this church is growing. This church is baptizing. If we can get, if we can get, to, uh, if we can get to that point in, in, in Forest Hill, we will, we will change cultures. Brother, there, there are churches out here that are, you'll take the lead. And so that's, this is why this is so important. So this isn't just another church. This is a congregation that's sending men out to preach. And if they can go back and say, look, this, this, is, what, this is exciting about Southwest. A few years ago, this, this, I could not say that. But today, those elders, Brother Gerhardt and Brother Seabird and Brother Westbrook and Brother Garza, they can, they can look in that church and say, this works because it, their, their, their membership believes in it. We need that moment in our churches, and I just pray, God, that you will resolve in your hearts that when those elders stand before you, whatever it is that, that the preacher says, you'll get behind them, and I will be the engine of evangelism. They cannot do this without the members. And so I hope that you'll think about that very carefully tonight. This is a laboratory. And what, brethren, what I just did was a, was a closed environment and life was not represented. You see, it's, it, we don't go A, B, C, one, two, three. It's, it's just, this is not how we work. And I realized that I ran through that with Scott and I, I'll just be, I'll be honest, there's a lot of studies that go just like that. In fact, most of the studies go just like I just did. When I get to that point, we're going to baptize them. But I, I also want to be real with you tonight that you're going to meet people that don't follow the model. They don't go A, B, C, 1, 2, 3. They go A, G, F, D, 1, 10, 6. Brother, they're all over the map. So what I want to do just quickly tonight is apply the model to real life scenarios. I want to deal with your fears and I want to answer those difficult questions. The Hackett family is a faithful family. They're always going to attend. They're going to park in the Hackett parking spot. They're going to come in the Hackett door, sit in the Hackett pew, and I'm watching them right now. It's going to be Papa Hackett, which is Jeff Hackett, Mama Hackett, which is Melody Hackett, and the four Hackett children. There's going to be the oldest Hackett, which is Clifton Hackett, pictured behind me. Then there's going to be the other three Hacketts. There's going to be Allison Hackett, Jed Hackett, and little Caitlin Hackett. And they will always sit in the Hackett pew. This morning, there's somebody else sitting with the Hacketts, and I don't know her. I immediately walked up and I said, hey, Jeff, how, how's your week gone? He said, good, good. I have one mission. I love the Hackett's, but I'm just concerned about this person right here because that's a contact. And for preachers of all the steps in the model, you know, those six steps, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really dig into those six steps with, with the elders and preachers because that's the foundation of those six steps. The hardest step for the gospel preacher is step one. Do you know why? Because we're ministering to you. Because we're in the hospitals with you. Because we're in your homes. Because we're spending time with the brethren. We don't know the people you know. Brethren, tonight you work with people that, that your preacher does not know. You grew up here. You have neighbors, co-workers, family members. You're the answer to the contact issue. The preacher's not. So when I'm a preacher, my number one source for contacts is Sunday morning. And when I find somebody that, that I don't know, 
I'm immediately gravitating. And so I went over to the Hackett pew, and I'm, I'm kind of like going down the list, and she's sitting really close to Clifton. I said, hey, Clifton, who do you got with you this morning? Callie. He smiles. I said, ah, Callie, my name's Rob. What's your, you know, glad you're here. And she says, I said, Clifton, is, how, do you know Callie? Yes, he's my girlfriend. And I looked at Callie. I said, Callie, uh, I'm going to tell you everything I know about Clifton. And uh, she just smiled and laughed. And Clifton says, don't do that, Rob. You know? and, and so I'm, I'm going to start immediately trying to connect. I know I need to make a contact. And I got a prospect. But I'm going to take notice Sunday morning. So as we're sitting together about over here, I kind of pop over in my eyes during the prayer just to see what Callie's doing. She's praying. I noticed during the, uh, the singing, she's singing. I noticed she brought a Bible. And I kind of look over as I'm preaching. She's taking notes. I said, she's interested. She came back Sunday night and Wednesday, and she just keeps coming. Clifton was sick one Sunday morning. You know who was sitting in the Hackett pew? Callie. I said, this is really good. And I'm, I'm, thinking, of me, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of ways that we can help bring her to the cross. Well, I'm, it was Clifton. He came to me. And, and so he's known Callie a long time. And so he came up to me and he said, hey, Rob, he says, I, you know, I bring, bring in Callie. I said, yeah, I've been, I've been it's really, he said, Rob, I've known her a long time. We've been seeing each other. He said, Rob, I, I think she's the one, Rob. I said, well, Clifton, that's a big statement. He said, yeah. I said, I said well, I said, uh, she's a sweet girl, Clifton. He said, but I got a problem. I said, well, what is it? Rob, she's not a Christian. He said, Rob, can you help me? I said, well, Clifton, uh, that just happens to be my specialty. I said, I love it. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, did you know, Clifton, on Friday night at my house, we're having a game night? He said, you are? I said, and we're playing Callie's favorite game. He said, you are? I said, what is it? I said, he said, oh, uh, he said, we like to play skip ball. I said, bring her on. I said, we're playing skip ball on Friday night. I said, he said, Rob, are you going to try to do a Bible study? I said, and I said Clifton, I said, uh, you're one step ahead of me, son. I said, I said, just bring her on in. I said, I want you to tell me what time works. And whatever time she can come, that's when we're going to do it. He said, I got gotcha. you. So, so Monday, Tuesday, kind of, you know, come by. And I'm, I'm waiting for that phone call. Clif hey, Clifton, hey, Clifton, what's going on? You know, and he said, Rob, if, you not heard the news? I said, what do you mean the news? He said, Rob. He says, uh, Rob Kelly's dad. Rob, Rob, he had a heart attack. I said, man, I didn't know Clifton. I said, Clifton, what hospital? I'll, I'll be right there. He said, Rob, she didn't make it. Rob, uh, he didn't make it. And I said, Clifton, I I'm so sorry. I said, I, I don't even know what to say. He said, and, and immediately, you can, you can just hear the, his voice. It changes. He said, Rob, what, what are we going to do? He said, Rob, you know, we're going to do this Bible study. And, and, and I said, well, hang on just a minute, Clifton. I said, let, 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 let me, let, let's just put it on pause. I said, we've got to get this church engaged right now. I said, we need the flowers ordered. We need the food prepared. We need the cards in the mail. We need the receiving line set up. We've got to engage this church. And if there's one thing Willett's good at, they're good at coming together in the community. And so we put out the emails. We made the phone calls to the food groups. I mean, there was so much food pouring into the funeral home. The Anderson, Mr. Anderson calls me. He says, hey, Rob. He said, you know all that food you guys are bringing to the funeral? I said, yes, sir. He said, stop. He said, there's no more room for food. He said, Rob, you got to stop. I said, okay. And so, so I mean, we, we surrounded that family with love. And, I mean, everybody's lined up. We're hugging, you know, and praying. And Do you know where Callie Hudson was on Sunday morning sitting in the pew? She didn't miss one service. I was blown away. And uh, people were, you know, you know, you could see him, the ladies sitting next to her, you know, patting her on the back. And you, you, you can't imagine what she's going through. And so some little bit of time transpires, and Clifton and I are talking a little bit. And, he, and Clifton says, Rob, we, we got a problem. I said, uh, well, what is it, Clifton? He says, Rob, he says, uh, what are you going to do when she asks? I said, I don't know. He said, Rob, she's going to ask. And what are you going to tell her when she asks? Because, Rob, she's going to ask you, you know, this question. And I said, I know. And I said, I really don't know the answer. I said, Clifton, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to give Callie the book Muscle and a Shovel. And I said, I want you to have her read it. And I need some time. And I'm going to do some study on this. And I said, I'll come up with an answer. I said, but you just buy us some time. He said, Rob, I'll give it to her. So he goes back on our evangelism table. He grabs Muscle and a Shovel, and he gives it to her. 
She calls me a few days later. I said, Clifton, did you give her the book? He said, I did. I said, that will buy you some time. And he said, I said, uh, Rob, um, she's finished. I said, finished? I said, what do you mean fit? Rob, she stayed up all night and read it. And she's got these questions. And I said, uh, Clifton, uh, schedule her to come to the house. And I said, we'll, we'll start the studies. So she, she sits around the house and we, we started study number one. And we breezed through it. She could have taught me study one. In fact, at the end of the study, I looked at Callie and said, Callie, any questions about study number one? She says, not really. She said, Rob, you got anything more challenging? Any, anything else? Because I already knew study one. Rob, I've been listening to you for a year, over a year, and, and I read Muscle and a Shovel. And Rob, I do have some questions. I said, well, you hold your questions, Callie. I know what she wants to ask. Let me go, go to study three. We're at study number three, and we're going through the material. And she's all in. She gets it. I mean, she, 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 understands, she understands sin. She gets, she gets repentance. She gets confession. And when we get to baptism, we had a problem. And the problem was that she got it. Brethren, she put her head on the table, and she bawled. Literally, tears were dripping off the table. Thank God for my wife, because I'm not going to do this. This is why you need a silent partner, men. When you're studying with a woman, you need a lady to be your partner. Because sometimes someone's got to put their arm around you. My wife put her arm around her, and she just held her. And she just bawled. That day in my office, I was, I was trying to put myself in Callie's shoes. I knew it was coming. And I thought, now, Rob, if, if, if you were Callie and, and, and the preacher sitting over here doing the study, what, what, how can you deal with this? What can you say to help them through this? And I said, there's your example. Is there something that can be said? Well, Hebrews 11. Take your Bibles to Hebrews 11. I'm going to show you just a couple things that, that help me. So let's go to Hebrews 11. And, and I'm going to look at specifically verse number 4. That's where I'm going to start. Hebrews 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel un offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous and testifying, notice this, of his gifts, and by it being dead, yet speaketh. Brethren, did you know tonight that the dead can speak? They can speak. And what I want you to do tonight is listen to the dead. I want you to listen very carefully. Do you know we have an example of this? I want you to go to Luke chapter 16. In Luke chapter 16, we have an example of the dead speaking. And in Luke chapter 16, this is the account of rich man and Lazarus. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 16, there was a rich man, a certain rich man. He fared sumptuously every day. He was clothed in purple and fine linen. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. And he sat at the, the gates full of sores. And he desired to be fed from the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. And the Bible says in verse number 22, It came to pass that the beggar died and he was carried away uh, by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died. And he was also buried. And the Bible says, And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. He sees Abraham afar off. And Abraham in his bosom. And uh, he says, A Lazarus in his bosom. Excuse me. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham. He said, Have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and come cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in the flame. And the Bible said, But Abraham said, O son, remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and Lazarus evil things, and now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And I want you to pay very close attention to what happens here. And then he said in verse 27, I pray thee, Father Abraham, that thou wouldest... Send him to my father's house. Well, listen to this. Because here's the answer. I have five brethren that he may testify to them, lest they come into this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, All oh, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went from the dead, they would repent. And he said unto them, if they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they listen or be persuaded that though one rise from the dead. Number one, the dead can speak. Number two, I know what they'd say. Tonight, do you have a grandmother, a mother, a father, 
Do you have a family member, friend that's died outside of Christ? And if tonight, if, if tonight we could hear from them, if tonight they could sit next to you, if tonight they could, they could say something to you and you could hear their words, I want you tonight to consider what would they tell you to do? What would they say to you tonight? What would, they, would they tell you that, you that here's what you need to do to be right with God? Would they encourage you to obey the gospel? Would they encourage you to live right before God? Brethren, every man in eternity or woman tonight is going to encourage you to obey God, I promise. They won't lie. They'll tell you exactly what you need to do to be saved. You know, sometimes you can take a very negative moment and make it a very powerful moment. And at that, at that time in my office, I said, I think I know the answer. I, I think that the devil's met his match. Luke 16 is the answer. Hebrews 11 and verse 4 is the answer, and I've just got to put it together. So, so she walks into our house. We're sitting there, and her, I mean, she, her head's on the table, and she's just, and I know it, and I realize that I, I can't even imagine the pain. And she's beginning to realize and comprehend that, listen, what about my dad? She can't even utter the words. So, so I, here's what I did. I gave her a couple minutes. I said, Callie, I said, I, I want to be you for just a minute. I said, because I don't think you can ask me said, I think I know why you're upset. And I said, uh, are you concerned about your dad? And she raised her head and looked at me and she said, she said, Mr. Rob, what about my dad? I said, Callie, uh, I've got some questions about your dad that only you can answer. I said, number one, I said, Callie, was your dad a good man? She said, well, yes. I said, okay. I said, Callie, was he a hardworking man? Yeah. I said, what do you do? And now she's talking about her dad. That's what I wanted her to do. I want to reason with her. I, I, gotta, I gotta get her thinking. Okay, so I'm just gonna ask questions about her dad. I, I asked several of them. I said, Callie, was he an honest man? Well, yeah, Mr. Rob. Religious man? Well, yes. I said, well, Callie, had anybody ever taught you, your dad what I just taught you? I don't, I don't know, Mr. Rob. I, I don't think so, I don't know. I said, okay. I said, Callie, I want you to listen to somebody tonight. If your dad right now could speak to you, if he, he could come back, Callie, I, I want you to be honest with me. Would your dad tell you to do what the Bible says? W would he tell you to do what we've just read? Like if, we, if he could talk, would he say, Callie, I want you to do this right here. Would your dad tell you to do what the Bible And she looked at me. She said, my dad would always tell me to do what the Bible says. Callie, I said, I will ask you to do no more, no less. I said, Callie, I said, you read your Bible. And I said, I want to know what you think you need to do. And she looked at me. She said, Rob, I need to be baptized. I said, let's go. Nicole and I got up. We started walking towards the baptistry. Clifton was with us. He's in the study. We're all walking. We all, believe you me, I felt a huge weight off my, my shoulders. And so we're walking to that baptistry. And all of a sudden, she stops. And she turns around and walks right back to the table. She sits down again. So we turned around. Sat down around the table. Callie, you okay? No, Mr. Rob. Mr. Rob, do you know how my brother uh, Chandler's been coming? I said, yes. I said, Mr. Rob, I, I think I'm just going to wait for Chandler. Because we'll do it together. Brethren, the devil doesn't give him up easily. He is the master at deception. And he knows this delay tactic. This is all it is. He knows if he can get Callie to delay, if he can delay one day, you'll delay two days. And if you delay two days, he's got gotcha. you. Brethren, he's met his match. I know exactly what God wants her to do, and so do you. And so I just looked at her. I said, Callie, I said, uh, <laughs> I said, I wish every brother had a sister like you. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, you want your brother to become a Christian. She says, I do. I said, when do you want him to become a Christian, Callie? Well, after we teach him. I said, Callie, now, you've been taught. Yeah. I said, and you want your brother to become a Christian after he's taught? Yeah. I said, Callie, why would your brother become a Christian after he's taught if you don't show him the way? I, I said, Callie, do you want him to wait? No. I said, Callie, someone's got to show him the way. I can't think of a more powerful way to help your brother see the importance of this than you doing what you need to do now. 
And she looked at me and she said, Mr. Rob, she says, you're right. She said, if, if, if my brother needs to see this. And I said, I think so. She said, Mr. Rob, I'm ready. We went to the baptistry and we baptized her. Brother, when she came out of that water, I mean, we just hugged. We rejoiced. I mean, Nicole and I were so thankful to God. We prayed. One of the elders, Hugh Wayne Clark, was there because he, he's a neighbor to, the, to this family. And, and so we're just, we're just so thankful because we know she just overcame a challenge because it was, a, it was a difficult path. So I go off to Bible camp very shortly after this baptism. And as I'm at Bible camp, my phone rings. And it was, it was Clifton. And I thought Clifton was just going to, you know, hey, Rob, let me tell you how things are going, you know. It was anything but that. Kelly said, Rob, we've got a problem. And I said, what do you mean, Clifton? He said, Rob. He said, Callie went home. And she told Mama, hey, hey, Mama, I need to tell you a little bit about what's happened. Mama, Mama I, I, listen, I've been doing these Bible studies with Mr. Rob and Miss Nicole. Who's Mr. Rob and Miss Nicole? Well, he's the preacher. You know, Mom, you know I've been going to Willett Church? Yes. With Clifton? Yes. Well, I decided to do a Bible study. Why were you doing a study? Kelly, you're already saved. But, but, but Mom, I just wanted to learn some more. And I was reading my Bible. And Mama, I realized I needed to be baptized. To be what? Uh, Mom, I read in the Bible that I needed to be baptized. Kelly, you've already been baptized. Oh, but Mama, I, I did not realize that I was saved. You know, I, I was lost and I needed to be baptized to be saved. And... Kelly, we don't believe that. Kelly, that's not what you were raised. But mama, listen, I've learned this in the Bible and I want to show, Kelly, I don't want you to show me this. Kelly, how dare you go behind my back and do this? But mama, I read the Bible and Kelly, how dare you dishonor your father like that? Friend, it's over. I mean, at that point, Clifton said, Rob, it, it's, she just curled up into a ball. He said, Rob, she's sobbing. Her mother is angry. She won't talk to her. She's, she's you know, betrayed her family. She, she's, Rob, she's asking me right now, should I turn back? He said, what am I going to do? I said, I, said, I don't know. I said, Clifton, I've never dealt with this before. I said, I need help. Brother, I, I, I put my phone down. I said, I'll call you back. I, I, I dialed Hugh Wayne Clark. He's one of our elders. I said, Hugh Wayne, here's the situation. I don't know what to do. He said, Rob, your job is to teach the children at Bible camp. And my job is to take care of Callie. He said, I've got it covered. He calls Clifton and he said, Clifton, I want you to get Callie over to our house tonight. You've got to get her in our house. He said, we have got to talk to Callie. He said, it's going to be hard, Mr. Hugh Wayne. Just tell her that Miss Joe's making supper. Get her over to the house, Clifton. He said, we'll come. Sure enough, Callie and, 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 and uh, Clifton pull in. They sit around the table. They're talking. They're eating. Callie is not her. She's a joyful soul. She is not joyful. And, 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 and Hugh Wayne can see that. And finally, he said, Callie, I know something's wrong. What's going on? Mr. Hugh Wayne, she said, I, I told my mama. I thought you'd be so proud of me. And, and she says, I betrayed my family. I, Mr. Hugh Wayne, I don't know what to do. I, I, she says, I... Mr. Hewitt, she won't even talk to me. And do you think I should go back maybe to go to church with mom for a while? Because I don't know what to do, Mr. Hugh Wayne. Uh, and and she, he just listened. You got to be a good listener. When she was finally done, wisdom of the eldership came out. And thank God for elders. And uh, he, he looked at her and he said, uh, Callie, can I, can I talk to you just for a minute? He says, I'm going to say some things that are going to surprise you. Number one, I know why your mom's upset. I would be too. Huh? Cat Callie, does she know what you know right now? Does anybody ever taught your mom? I mean, does she know the things that you've learned from? She says, no, Mr. Hugh Wayne. I said, Callie, do you want your mom to become a Christian? Yes, Mr. Hugh Wayne. Callie, uh, there's only one way that's going to happen. And if you turn around now, she'll, she's never going to get there. Kelly, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's going to be hard for the next month. I mean, for the next couple of weeks, your, your mother's going to be this much less angry, and you won't even notice. He says, but in a few months, you're going shopping for shoes. You, I, I promise. How do you know that, Mr. Hugh Wayne? Because she loves you, Kelly, and you cannot be angry forever. Kelly, my admonition to you is stay the course, be faithful. We'll walk with you. And one day, if you'll be faithful, you'll lead your mother to Christ. You know where she was on Sunday morning, sitting in the pew. She never missed. He's not there. 
I walked up, I said, Callie, where, where's Chandler? My mom forbid him, Rob. He is never allowed to come to this church again. Mr. Rob, now how, how are you, in, how are y'all going to study with Chandler now, Rob? I said, I never was. I said, Callie, back on the evangelism table, there just so happens to be these little booklets. I said, it's good, green, blue, and red. I want you and Clifton to take three sets, and I want you to teach him. Me, Mr. Rob? Mr. Rob, I, I don't. I said, you can read, can't you? She said, yes. I said, Callie, you and Clifton teach Chandler the gospel. You know what happens when you do Bible studies? Oh, we're not done. See, after this, I notice that over here on the left-hand side, I'm preaching, and there comes this young man inside. His name is Marshall. And I notice that Marshall keeps coming. And I said, I said Chandler, who's Marshall? Oh, he's a member of the football team. I said, I looked at Marshall sitting right there. I said, Chandler, have you taught Marshall the gospel yet? You can do that with young people. Be very direct. They can handle it. And he looks at me and says, no, Mr. Rob. I said, no, Chandler, they're called back to the Bible. Has anybody ever heard of them? Green, blue, and red. They're right here. I said, I want you to go back to the evangelism table. I want you to grab three, two sets. I want you to teach him the gospel. Me, Mr. Rob? I said, yes. You're perfectly capable. That's what happens when you do that. Oh, we're not done. <laughs> it's amazing what happens when churches begin teaching people the gospel. The best baptisms that happened at Willette were not the ones I did. They're the ones you did. This is Benita. So I'm down at Jackson, the Sidewell Road Church of Christ, Jackson, Mississippi, Gary Hampton. And I'm sitting in the front pew, and I'm just about to speak. And my phone rings, and I look at that phone. It's Jack Honeycutt. I know Jack's not going to call me unless it's an emergency. So I slide down in the pew. I say, Jack, what's going on? He said, Rob, you'll never guess who walked through the doors, Rob. Rob, it's Benita. She's in the building. Chandler baptized his mother into Christ. Brethren, I'm not suggesting that every situation is going to turn out like this, but here's what I am suggesting. If we will teach people the gospel of Christ, I think there are more people out there that may be saved than you realize. Don't ever assume they can't. Because if you'll, be, if you'll have the, the courage just to sit down and let them read the word of God, this book has power. There's power in the cross. There's power in the blood. And if we would just show them, there are families, entire families that have been changed by the blood of the lamb. But they will never be changed if we sit in our pews and do nothing. I have so many questions that I'm asked in evangelistic up. Environments. I don't have time to cover them all. But I want to assure you, whatever situation you're in, whatever it is you face, there's answers in this book. I'm going to skip a few of these tonight. I've got charts that cover them. I talked about the religious experience. And that's a, that's a common question that I get. This is going to give you a couple things to consider. When someone wants to tell you about their religious experience, Never challenge their sincerity. Never laugh. Never accuse them of lying. If you do that, the study is over. Brethren, they can convince themselves that these things happen. And do you know how I know that? Sheila Birdwell. <laughs> right after the Bible study, Nicole and I are in the Birdwell house, and we're doing these new convert studies. And Sheila, she just has a way about her. And she's a, she's a, she, she can make me laugh almost like no other. And so we'll be sitting there, and she's like, Rob? I said, yes, Sheila. You know that religious experience I told you about? I said, yeah. I said, let me see. It was a dark and stormy night. And, and the lightning struck the tree. The tree caught on fire, came over. The, yes, Rob, she says, yes. Rob, I still believe it happened that way. This is after her baptism. She was watching my expression. I want to ask for some feedback from the audience. When a person becomes a Christian, the Bible uses a term to describe their maturity. What is the word that the Bible uses? Babe. They're babes. Now, here's my second question. How much can you teach a babe? Not much. Do you know what I did when she did that? I said, Sheila, I'm really not sure what happened that night, but I'm thankful you obeyed the gospel. She says, me too. And I just ignored it. 
She's going to grow. And let me share with you what happens when you let people grow. A year later, I am sitting at that very table. My family's there. We're eating the spaghetti dinner. It's her favorite dinner. And so we're eating the spaghetti dinner. And, and she says, Rob. I said, yes, Sheila. She said, do you remember that religious experience I told you about? I said, yes, Sheila. Let me see. Uh, the lightning struck the tree. The tree caught on fire, came over. She said, yes, Rob, that one. She said, Rob, I was thinking last night. Rob, I don't know where I came up with that story. In fact, I'm not even sure if that happened anymore. No, Rob, I just want you to. I said, no, Sheila, listen, listen. It really doesn't matter, does it? I'm just thankful you obeyed the gospel. What happened in that year? What happened? She grew, and I let her. Brethren, you cannot expect a brand new Christian to be where you're at. When they walk in the door, let, just, let me be clear. They may not dress like you. They may not talk like you. They, 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 have, they are not where you're at. And the worst thing you can do as a member of the church is to, to put the standard of a 30, 40, 50, 60 year Christian on a two day year old infant in the church. You will run them off. Be careful what you say. Give us time to help them grow. The elders are fully aware of those things. They're not going to ignore it, but they cannot solve a lifetime of religious error in three days. I think it's said that it took God three days to get Egypt, uh, to Israel out of Egypt. It took God 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. Remember where you're at and how long it took you to get there. What if they're living together? Let me, I'm just going to give you two more scenarios and we're done. Okay, I'm going to deal with the living together scenario. So right after book two of Amy and Evan, I get this phone call from Sheila. This is the mother. Rob, um, is Evan and Amy still there? I said, Sheila, I've got to tell you about this study. Sheila, we are one study away. She, Rob, <laughs> Rob, listen to me. I said, yes, ma'am. I said, no, they're gone. Good. Rob, we've got to talk. Rob, do you know that Evan bought a house in Lafayette? I said, I do. Rob, Amy moved in. Rob, they're living together. They're not married, Rob. Rob, I thought you should know about this. I said, well, I'm glad you called. Um, Rob, what are you going to do about it? What do you mean, what am I going to do about it? He's your son. I mean, and so, so we're, we're on the phone. We're talking about this. And she said, now, Rob, you promised me you won't tell him I told you. I said, I promise, Sheila. Rob promised me I had a pinky promise on the phone. I'm not going to tell. And so we're finally done with that phone call. And um, Nicole looks at me, and I look at her, and... I said, Nicole, we've run across this before, and we're going to do the same thing we always do. Brother, I've dealt with this many times, and I want to share with you how, how we have dealt with this, because it, it, it works very well. We're going to go into the third Bible study like we always do. We're going to walk through those passages, and we're going to get to passages on sin, and we're going to define words. Then we're going to get to repentance. And I'm in Acts 2.38, and I decided that's where I'm going to drive my sword into the, into the soil, right there. I said, I said, Evan, would you read Acts 2.38 for me? He said, sure, repent. I said, stop. I said, let's talk about that. And so we talked about it. And I said, Evan and Amy, would it be okay if we just stopped the study here and we're just finished? What? But Mr. Robert says to be baptized. I said, I know, but I think we're done. But Mr. Robert said, I know. Hannah, bring the cookies. And I said, so Hannah brought the cookies in. I know exactly where I'm going with this. I said, Amy and Evan, I said, before we go any further, I've got to tell you a story. Jesus told stories a lot. What you're going to do is take them outside of themselves and parallel something. And so what I did is I just went back to a Terry Starks, Marlena. This is another couple years ago. They were living together. I said, you know, guys, I want to tell you about a friend of ours that I met. And I told them about how we met them and they were living together and we studied with them. And, and then and I can remember on that table when Marlena looked across the table, she realizes she's, she's in sin and Terry knows it. And she looks at Nicole and she says, Nicole, I have no place to live. And Nicole said, yes, you do. She moved in just for a couple days and uh, married them, baptized them. I told, it's a 30-minute story. I told them everything. You could, they were glued to me. We finished the story. I said, now, you guys have a lot of talking to do. I said, I want you guys to call me back when you want to go further. And they said, okay. They walk out the house. 
Now, Amy and Evan are kind of, you could tell, they, they, they know something's up. They get in the car. She looks at Evan. She says, Evan, I think they know about us. The whole county knew about them. All right. Nothing's a secret in a small town. And um, so in any case, they go home. And it wasn't a matter of just time. She calls me back. She says, uh, Rob, she says, uh, Rob, I'm moving out. I said, why? And she said, Rob, I'm, I'm moving out. I said, well, why, Amy? She said, Rob, I, I'm living with Evan. I said, I know. I said, where are you going? She said, well, I'm going to live with my grandmother. I said, good choice. Mr. Rob, can you meet me at the, the baptistry? She said, I need to be baptized. I said, I'll be right there, Amy. Good, because Evan will be right behind me. He was. Now they are. Okay, there's nothing that this nation needs more than the gospel of Christ right now. We want to solve our problems? I'm telling you, this is what it needs. It needs this. It needs the great physician. Because here it is. Here's a family. And let's, let's talk about this family. Because it goes all the way back to Scarlett. It goes all the way back to Scarlett, who was taught the gospel by her husband. And then it goes all the way back to her mom uh, uh, and dad, Jackie and Sheila. Then it goes all the way to Evan. Then it goes all the way to Amy. And someday, if God allows us to live long enough, guess who else gets to obey the gospel? i got one more thing I'm going to deal with, five minutes, and then, then it's over. But I have to deal with it. I'm sitting in my living room, and Sharon looks up at me, and she says, Now, Rob, in my first marriage, I'm going to be human tonight, because preachers are human. I think sometimes we forget that. Friend, that is the last thing I want to hear. I'm being human. The last thing I want to hear in a Bible study is now in my first marriage. I don't want, I do not want to deal with a marriage issue. It's, it's difficult, it's emotional, it's draining, and I have no idea where this is going to go. And I can remember, I, I kind of just cringed when I heard that. But I realized something, and, I, and, and Brother Clark, you don't know this, but you're the one that taught this to me. And I was listening to you because this is the passage I think about time and again. And I can remember you saying this. Here's Jesus talking to his disciples. And he even tells these individuals who loved him. What does he tell them? I have yet many things I need to teach you. But what does he say? You, you can't handle it right now. You're not ready. So when, when I've got a people that I've just met and they're sitting in my house, they know nothing. Do you think I need to start out with marriage, divorce, and remarriage? Is that what we're going to start to study? Absolutely. They're not ready for that. I know they're not ready. So, so that passage, I keep thinking about this as I'm doing studies. That I've got to wait until they're ready to digest this. So faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So I even prolong the studies. And I even, I drew it out because I'm trying to help them develop faith in God and relationship building. And we're going through these studies a little slower than we normally do it. We even spent extra time. I can remember one day Sharon Fisher said, Rob, she says, she said, man, I'm, I'm struggling. I said, what's wrong? I, I'm not ready for school to start. I said, what do you mean? My classroom's not ready. I said, I said, could we help you? She said, you'd help me? So Hannah, Jared, and we all went down to her class. We spent an entire four hours helping her with her classroom. We were supposed to do a Bible study. And I did, I, one of the reasons I did that is because I'm trying to kick the can. Because I know I need to strengthen the relationship. I, I need to give her time to grow. Now, we're in the third study. If you open your red booklet tonight to page four, this is where you're at, right here. All right, everybody go to 1 Corinthians. You got a Bible. Let me share with you how I do this. We're in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. And I'm going to let the Bible do all the work. All right. So here we are. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators. And I looked at Jimmy Fisher, and this is the question I asked. Jimmy Fisher, do you know what fornication is? He said, well, yeah. I said, I just want to make sure. All right, let's go to the next one. Idolaters. I said, Sharon, Sharon. I said, Sharon, do you know what an idolater is? Well, yes, Rob. Those are those people that worship gold things in the, in the jungles. It's close enough. I mean, it's close. I said, it's close enough. So I just, I'm, that's not where I'm going. All right, let's go to the third one. Adulterers. I said, guys, I said, uh, can we take a few minutes and talk about this? Yeah. I said, do you, do you guys know what adultery is? I think so. 
I said, well, let's just make sure. Take your Bible. Everybody do this with me. I'm going to, I'm going to have you write down four things in your book tonight. So you got your simplified. I'm going, to say, I'm going to strongly encourage, especially my preacher friends, to write these down. Okay, these did not originate with me. I said, but these, are, these have helped me so many times. So I'm going to have you write down just four simple things tonight. All right, here it is. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 19. I'm going to go with you. So I'm in Matthew 19, and the Bible says, and, and, the, and the Pharisees came to Jesus, tempting him. Notice this, uh, that they might have to accuse him. And they said, Jesus, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now notice this here. Notice what Jesus says, have you not read? No direct answers. This is another opportunity. He said, have you not read? I would suggest if more people would follow Jesus when it comes to marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and have people read the Bible, we'd solve a lot of problems. I'm not really concerned about what brother so-and-so says. I'm not concerned about what some school says. I want to know what the Bible says. And Jesus knows exactly how to teach this. And notice what he says in, in verse number four. And he answered and said unto them, have you not read that he which made them in the beginning made them male and female? And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to, uh, and, and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. And what God has joined together. Now I want you to stop right there. And I want you to write this down for me. God does the joining. I don't join people. God does the joining. So write that down. God joins people in marriage. The judge doesn't do the joining. The president doesn't do the joining. God does the joining. And not until God does the joining is there a marriage. Let's go here. Verse number five. What God has joined together. And let's, let's write this down. Do you know when God joins people, he always follows his law? One male, one female. If there's anything that we should know as the people of God, it's this. You cannot take two men and marry them because it violates what this passage says. This passage says one man and one woman. He said, well, Rob, the, the, the judge said, I'm not concerned about what the judge says. God is the one that makes marriage. And if there's going to be a marriage, you've got to follow his law. You can't violate his law. I've yet to find, I'm sure there's somebody out there that disagrees with this. And everybody says, amen, preacher. You can't marry two men. Let me tell you what else you can't do. A man can't go out there and take another, another man's wife. You can't do that. No more than you can go out there and take another man. It's not a marriage. You can call it whatever you want to, but you can't go out there and take another man's wife. It's called adultery. So let's notice what else the Bible says, all right? Let's, we're here in Matthew chapter 19. I want you here to be with me in verse 5. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, they twain shall be one flesh. Verse 6, what God has joined together, here it is, let not man put asunder. Point 3, only God can dissolve a marriage. That's it. God is the one that does the... Joining, God is one that does the dissolving. And just like God only joins those that follow his law, he only dissolves it when they follow his law. So there's only one way a marriage is dissolved. they got to follow the law. What is the law? Whosoever putteth away his wife, except it be for fornication, and marries another, committeth adultery. And he that marries her that is put away, committeth adultery. I didn't write it. That's the law. All I can do is tell you what the Bible says. I can show you what the Bible says. And so I have them write these things down. And then, and then I might even go a little further. I might even go into verse number 10. The disciples said, Jesus, if this is the case with a man and a woman, it's not good that anybody gets married. Oh, gee, they understood completely what Jesus said. And in fact, Jesus responds and said, all men cannot receive this saying. All schools won't teach it. All preachers won't preach it. All elders won't enforce it. That's what he's saying, isn't it? Not everyone will receive this. Friend, this is a powerful passage. And he nails it. But know what else he says? I like to end my teaching in verse number 12. For there are some eunuchs which were born from their mother's womb. Do you know there are some men who are not born fully functional? They're born eunuchs. Now let, me, let me give you a second category. Some are made eunuchs of men. I had an elder, and he was a, he was a logger. 
He came up to me one day and he said, Rob, no one knows this about me. He said, but you know, you were talking about eunuchs and I'm a eunuch. I said, what? He said, I'm a eunuch. So what do you mean? He said, Rob, I had an accident with the machine. I'm a eunuch. I never thought about it. But then this third category, you can't mess this up. Some are made eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. I only know one answer for that one, and I'm going to give it to you. I looked at Jimmy and Sharon. I said, Jimmy and Sharon, do you understand what the Bible teaches? They said, yes. I said, uh, Sharon, is your marriage lawful to Jimmy? She said, Rob, my first uh, husband left me for another woman. Thank God. But they're not always like that. I want you to meet Geneva. I'm sitting across the table. She looks at me and she says, Rob, I've got a problem. I said, what is it? She said, my husband's had five wives. I'm a very optimistic person. This is what I said. I said, well, I'm sure that they've all committed adultery. He says, Rob, they, they've not. I want you to meet my family. That's Miss Geneva. And she looked at me and she said, Rob, I love my heavenly father more than I love him. And she put him away. Let me introduce you to our, our, our children. This is uh, Nyla. She's the oldest on the left. Nyasia's in Nicole's lap. Hannah's going to pick her up from school on Thursday. There's Nakia sitting next to me. You do see the resemblance, don't you? That is my family. I looked at Geneva and I said, Geneva, I said, uh, whatever you need, we're here. I said, we're your family. And they're faithful. Brethren, it's not always easy to do a Bible study. But you've got to know this tonight as I close. If you're not willing to tell the truth in a Bible study, I want you to do everyone a favor. I want you never to do a Bible study. Because when the Lord looked at that rich young ruler, he said, you sell everything you have and you give it to the poor, take up the cross and follow me. And if you were going to lie to the rich young ruler, I don't want you to do a Bible study. Let him go. There are just a few other tools I've got out there. I just want to mention this one real quick. Uh, these are new convert materials. I'm, this is very important. But I'm going to spend time with your elders tomorrow on this point. Um, I, I'm sure you already have some things in place, but you don't want them to walk in the front door and walk out the back door. Lock the back door. Don't let them out. In order for that to happen, you need a robust new convert plan. And we're going to share us a few things about that. This right here is called Does It Matter? It's the one study method. Scott, you said you just used this. This right here is a powerful tool. Bobby Bates condensed back to the Bible to one lesson. Not everybody needs three lessons. Most people do. And he'll talk to you more about that later. This is called Believe the Bible. It's for people who don't believe in God. They don't believe in the Bible. They don't believe in Christ. Sometimes you need a different lure. 2020. This is during COVID. We traveled this nation. We went from Idaho to New Hampshire, from Florida to Texas. And there were 370 baptisms that year. In 2021... We did it again. This time we went up to, to Alaska. We had hit 11 churches in Alaska. We went all over the United States, 52 churches, 649 baptisms. 2022, we did it again. Got on the road and we traveled and we trained. 980 baptisms. This year, right now, we are 35% higher than we were last year at the same point. In five years of doing this work, and it was a slow start, We've got over 3,500 baptisms in this country. For those of you in the audience that don't think this is going to work, you're not arguing with me. God bless you for being here.